Can you hear me? There we go. Good morning again. It's good to see everybody. And are you enjoying this weather? I'm, I'm believing we're going to intercede that this is the end of winter. Is anybody with me? Yeah, yeah. And there are four people in the room that love snow, so we'll see whose prayers are the strongest. Uh, oh, man. Um, hey, it, it is great to have you here, and uh, we did note, uh, Pastor Eli noted that we have this, this uh, zip line above us that is not for humans to get on, just so that everybody knows. And it's just for this week, we're, we're doing some filming, as Pastor Eli noted, um, for our website, social media, and that kind of thing. So it'll be gone next week, we're anticipating, but that's what the ladder's here for, so that we can make sure that, that camera's working correctly, and uh, that's this week. It, it kind of reminds me, uh, in the position I was in before, we oversaw a, a campground. It was part of the network that I was with, and uh, at, the, at the campground, we installed some zip lines, uh, and they were, they were legit, like 100 feet off the ground, 400 feet long, uh, going between 20 and 40 miles an hour. It was, it was a, a scare, actually. The first time that Lori did it, it was pitch dark. We hadn't put up any of the lights yet. We just had the zip line in place. And so she hopped on ahead of me uh, because I was scared. Um, <laughs> and all I could hear as she went into the darkness was, ah! <laughs> but we, uh, so we had the zip line, we put kids on it, uh, uh, grade schoolers, high schoolers, junior, middle schoolers. Um, but I remember the night before kids camp, the first kids camp, and I woke in this cold sweat thinking, we're putting eight-year-olds on the zip line tomorrow. And it was completely safe, but you know, I'm a dad, I'm a grandfather, it just, I was, I was so nervous. But it turned out pretty well. The first, one of the first little riders was a third grade girl, eight years old. And we had trained the, the uh, people who were attending the, the zip line with safety and all that kind of thing, as well as helping people overcome their fears. And, and so the pastor who was, was helping get her on the zip uh, said, uh, uh, you look like you're a little bit afraid. And she said, I am. He said, well, tell me about what you're afraid of. And she said, I'm not sure that this will hold me up. And he said, oh, it'll hold you. And she said, no, I weigh 70 pounds. And he said, you, this will hold 6,000 pounds. And the little girl looked at him and said, oh, good, my mom could ride it. <laughs> the rule is, don't have kids. You just, you can't trust them. So, uh, man. Well, if you have your Bibles turned to, that has nothing to do with what we're going to talk about today. But if you have your Bibles turned to Philippians chapter 1 and verse 3, we're continuing in our series on Philippians. We're calling it the, a journal of joy. And this morning we're looking at this issue of the joy of loving people. And maybe you're in a situation where you're saying, you know, right now there's not a lot of joy in loving people. Well, I, I, I think that this morning as we look at, at, uh, at this text and at the scripture, I'm, I'm praying that God will help us to rediscover some joy in our relationships. You know, over time, Jesus, throughout the Gospels, was involved in Q&A, questions and answers. It seems like people would develop a question, they'd bring it to Jesus, he'd have a response, and we get to learn from it. But in one situation like that, there was an attorney, a lawyer, who came to Jesus in Matthew chapter 22 and verse 36, and he said, Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Now, when we read that from our perspective, we think, well, that's, a, uh, that's an interesting question. But it was a very, very typical question during this time. And what, they were, what the, the lawyer was really doing was testing whether Jesus was a legitimate rabbi or not. Because there was an answer that was an expected answer to this question. And Jesus replied in verse 37, following this question, and he said, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And probably at that point, the lawyer turned and, and decided, okay, you got the answer correct. Thank you very much. You are a legitimate rabbi. Because this is, this is what all of the rabbis, in fact, all of the Jewish young men, would have memorized early, early on. It was the expected answer among Jewish people of the time. They'd been taught from childhood, Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verses four and five. It's called the Shema, which uh, verse five actually begins with the word here, and the Hebrew word is Shema, and so they, they, they memorize it as the, the here portion of the Old Testament. They called it the Shema. And so Deuteronomy chapter six, verse four says, Hear, O Israel, 
verse 4, I'm sorry, it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. And then in verse 5, Moses went on and said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. So it makes perfect sense that this would be the highest obligation. It makes perfect sense that, that Jesus would have answered this way because he was a, a rabbi of the day. But as the attorney would have looked at him and said, okay, you're legitimate, and begun to, begin to, began to walk away, Jesus would have said, and? <laughs> and the attorney would have looked because this is unexpected. And the second is like it. Everybody went quiet because this was not the typical answer of a rabbi. And the second commandment is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus goes on and says, and all the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Now what I'd submit to you this morning is that commandment number two is much harder than commandment number one. It's easier to love God than it is to love people. Most, most of the time. You know, God tends to be perfect huh, all the time. And we tend to be imperfect pretty much all the time. So, but this is the second commandment, this commandment, to love your neighbor as yourself, to, 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 to love God and to love your neighbor as yourself. Really, that second commandment demonstrates our spiritual growth because it is difficult to love people. And so this morning, I want to look at this whole issue of loving other people and discovering joy in loving other people. We can grow in our love for people, and I want to investigate that this morning, how we can experience joy in those relationships that sometimes are difficult. And maybe you have somebody in your life who is very difficult to love. Maybe, uh, maybe you're a parent and, and your child is wandering from the faith and, and you feel like your child has, has turned his or her back on the things that you've taught them uh, throughout their lifetime. And, and now they're walking away from, from the faith and walking away from the things that are very, very dear to you. Maybe you have somebody uh, in your life who, who just, it seems like anger is their go-to emotion and, and they're just angry a lot and it's very difficult to love them. It's challenging. Maybe you have somebody who just, you, you just, you're forced into a situation where you have to spend time together, but you don't really connect. They become your spiritual growth challenge. And I want to look at the Apostle Paul's relationship with the Philippian church because I think there are some keys here that help us to learn how to experience joy in the midst of relationships, even difficult relationships. Philippians, we said it last week, I believe, that Philippians is a unique letter uh, from the Apostle Paul because uh, his relationship with, with the Philippians was a very, very warm relationship. When Paul wrote to Colossae, the church in, in Colossae, he, didn't, he had never visited Colossae. And so he's talking to them about theological things. And, but F Philippians is a much warmer book because they've got a very close relationship. And, and God was very good to us to show us some of the experiences that Paul had in Philippi when he was there. And we'll talk about those in just a moment. But one of the keys, I, I think the first key that I see with the Apostle Paul and his relationship with the Philippians is that Paul was grateful for the good. I believe it's one of the keys in developing strong relationships, that we would be grateful for the good in the relationship. Paul says he's thankful for the Philippians. In fact, the verse we read when we started, Philippians chapter 1 and verse 3 says, Paul says, I thank my God every time I remember you. I thank my God every time time I remember you, which seems natural if they've got this close relationship, until you begin to investigate all of Paul's experience in Philippi. We talked a bit about this last week. We kind of ran through it very quickly. We talked about the three people that Paul met in Philippi that are noted for us in Acts chapter 16. And it's a fascinating story. The first person is a wealthy woman, Lydia. She was, the Bible says that she was a seller of purple, which is a very expensive uh, commodity during the time. And, and it was pretty obvious that Lydia was very, very wealthy. And she was the first convert that Paul had in Philippi. Uh, uh, she came to know Jesus, put her faith in Christ, and, and had a conversion experience, and it was a wonderful thing. Paul continued to, to preach the gospel there in Philippi and in the area, and the next day, it looks like it was the next day, or at least very, very soon after that, there was a slave girl. So Paul went from ministering to the wealthiest of the wealthy to the poorest of the poor, 
She had really no social standing whatsoever. She couldn't earn an income. She was owned. She really was literally a slave. And she was owned by men who used her uh, spiritual power to speak into people's lives and know things that she shouldn't have naturally known and be able to predict the future. And they were making money off of her in that way. Well, she began to follow Paul and followed him, it looks like, for about three days. And she kept saying, this, these men have, uh, uh, have the word of salvation, essentially, is what she was saying. They are telling you the, the way of salvation, which sounds like a good message, but Paul picked up on something. He knew something wasn't right, and he began to sense that she was demon-possessed. And as he sensed that, uh, at one point, he turned and looked at this young woman and cast the demon out of her. Now, when he cast the demon out of her, he also took away her ability to produce income for her owners because now she was de depending on this demonic entity to be able to tell the truth, tell the future and speak into people's lives, things that she shouldn't have known. And now she was delivered. She'd been set free. So very interestingly, the, her owners became angry at Paul and began to say things about Paul. And it's interesting that they said, these men are teaching customs that are contrary to our city and to Rome. This is all in Acts chapter 16. You can go home this afternoon and read it. And when, when they said that, it was a very, very serious thing because Philippi was a Roman colony. And that meant that they were steeped in Roman culture. It was what they were about. If you, if, if you uh, uh, wandered from Roman culture, ro wandered from Roman law, wandered from honoring Caesar, those things were absolutely unacceptable. And so with that, that strong, strong culture that was dependent upon Rome, the slave girl's owner said, these men are teaching ways that are contrary to Rome, contrary to Philippi. That was extremely punishable. And what they did was they beat them with wooden rods and they threw them in jail. Now, subsequent to that, the third character that's really a, a dominant character in Acts chapter 16 is the jailer. Because Paul and Silas, as they went through this period in, in jail, it was midnight. They decided to, you know, go ahead and worship God in every situation, which is always a good thing to do. Worship God in every situation. So they begin worshiping, and they're singing psalms and hymns. And, and as they're singing, uh, one old preacher said God got into it and started tapping his foot and caused an earthquake. I don't know that that's how it happened, but there was an earthquake that took place. And when the earth began to quake, the prison doors swung open, and they had uh, their entree to escape. Seeing that, the jailer took out his sword and was ready to kill himself because he figured that they were escaping and that would have meant death for him, certainly by the authorities. And so he thought he'd get ahead of the, ahead of the curve and just take his own life. Paul and Silas saw from the jail cell that he was going to do that. Their bonds had been broken off. They were completely free to leave. And they called out from the jail cell, don't kill yourself, we're still here. And the, the jailer was so taken by their Christian character, which, by the way, that should happen with us too, shouldn't it? The way that we act really should uh, give people a cause to say, you know what, I'd like to live like that. That's exactly what happened. The jailer looked at them, and, and when he saw that they were still there, he didn't need to take his own life, that they had honored him by staying when they could have fled. He looked at them and said, what do I need to do to be saved? And the Bible records that they actually went to his house. His entire family got saved. They uh, washed their wounds, and, and there's more to the story, which is absolutely fascinating. Paul and Silas uh, uh, Later, uh, the, the, the authorities came and said, well, they don't have to stay in jail anymore. And the jailer said, well, that's good because they're already out. And they said, they're out already. And Paul and Silas said, yeah. And, and, and they said, well, just let them go. And Paul said, no, we're not going to just walk out because we're Roman citizens, which put the fear into the authorities because they knew that they needed. Anyway, on a Rom Roman, uh, I'm, I'm getting carried away. So that's what happened with Paul. So I have to say, I've never been beaten with wooden rods, and I've never spent a night in jail. <laughs> Should be happy for that somehow. <laughs> but this is quite an, quite an introduction to the city. And it's fascinating to me that even though Paul experienced that, experienced some really negative things in Philippi, that when he writes to the Philippian church and writes to the people in Philippi, he says, I thank God every time I remember you. What's happening there? 
Something happened with, 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 with Paul. And, I, you know, if I had been the Apostle Paul, I would have said, some of my memories are really good from Philippi. But the beating with the rod, not so much. I, I think, what, what if they had had social media during this time? What would Paul have posted? I, I, I don't know what, well, I have an idea of what Paul would have posted. I also have an idea of what I would have posted. And it would have been far different. I would have had a negative view, but can you imagine Yelp from Philippi? <laughs> Paul posts and says, you know, uh, Philippi, not so much. Uh, if you like to be beaten with rods and thrown in jail, yeah, go ahead. But he doesn't do that. I think what he's doing is he's living out 1 Corinthians 13, 5, which says, love does not dishonor others. It's not self-seeking. It's not easily angered. And this is... This is this is the key. And it keeps no record of wrongs. It's really amazing. But Paul discovered something that if, if, if you can get to this place relationally, there's joy in relationships. He could have complained about his mistreatment, but that wasn't the way that Paul was wired. That wasn't, that wasn't post-salvation Apostle Paul. Why? Because his heart had been changed and he understood that if you have gratitude in relationships and you choose to remember the best, God will give you great joy in relationships. And I know that there are people in the room this morning who have, have experienced great harm in some of your relationships. I, I understand that. And I'm not saying that anybody should stay in an abusive situation. I'm not saying that at all. But what I am saying is that if we begin to focus on the good, that there's great joy in relationships. I'm reminded of uh, Clara Barton. Uh, someone came to Clara Barton uh, for help, and uh, she uh, was going to give it to her. Her friend came to her and said, Clara, don't you remember what they did to you? And this person had caused her great harm. And Clara Barton's response was, she said, don't you remember what, what they did to you? And Clara Barton responded and said, I distinctly remember forgetting that. I want to live that kind of a life, don't you? And if we'll build relationships where we're thankful for the good, that's, that's where the joy is. That's where the joy is. So the first thing I see with the Apostle Paul is that he expressed gratitude for the relationship. The second thing that I notice is that he practiced positive praying. I didn't plan for that to all be peas, by the way, but it turned out he practiced positive praying. He prays for the Philippians. And you know, sometimes, sometimes our prayers can become a complaint list. Or they can become a, 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 an information time that we tell God about our situations. I don't know whether you've ever been there or not, but God, you might not know that I'm out of money. <laughs> God, you might not know what they did to me. God, you might not know how much this hurt. Uh, or, we, or we pray, God, you know how they're addicted and it's almost impossible to come out of that addiction. Or God, you know what their attitude is. You know that they're always angry. And we begin to, to give this litany of negatives. I love the way the Apostle Paul prayed for the Philippians. He says, and this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight so that you may be able to discern what is best and be pure and blameless for the day of Christ. Filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. So let me ask you this morning, do you have somebody in your life that is just difficult to love? Maybe it's a person at work, maybe it's a family member, we've talked about that. I'd encourage you, if you've got somebody in mind, and I'm, I prayed last night, I prayed again this morning that the Holy Spirit would give us individuals so that we could apply what we're learning this morning. So if you've got somebody in mind that maybe it's a little bit challenging to love, let's try this, try this just, just for a week. Maybe you can make a commitment just for a week to pray the Apostle Paul's prayer for the Philippians and see after a week what might happen in them and, and in you. See what God might do in each of us. That we pray Paul's prayer to help us focus on God's will for the person and not what's going wrong in the relationship. That we pray, God, let their love for you abound still more and more. That we pray, God, give her real knowledge and discernment. God, help him to approve the things that are excellent. 
God, help her to be sincere and blameless until the day of the Lord Jesus. God, fill him with the fruit of righteousness. This is what I can tell you, because I've, I've experienced this myself, that the person you're praying for won't be your enemy for very long. Your perspective will change. And I believe their lives can be changed because of that kind of positive praying. Listen, God has set you in the place that he set you with your sphere of influence for a very specific reason. You may say, I don't know why I'm in this job. It seems like this is a dead-end job, and I don't know how to get out of it, and it seems like I've been stuck here a lot. lot." Listen, God has a plan for you right where you are. I'm not saying you're going to stay there forever, but for today, wherever you are, God's got a plan for you, and he's got a plan for me exactly where we are. And he wants us to be, have this kind of an impact on the situations and the relationships that we find ourselves in. So first, we're grateful for the relationship. Second, we're praying positive prayers. And the third thing that I'd recommend as, as we look for joy in the midst of relationships is that we would be patient and realize that God's still at work. Again, I love Paul's relationship with the Philippians. In Philippians chapter 1 and verse 6, he says, Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. I think we gain patience when we realize a couple of things. The first thing is I gain patience when I begin to realize how much God has forgiven me. Is there anybody here this morning who has been forgiven by God? I would guess that all of us who raise our hands would not want to project on the screen the things we've been forgiven of. Are you with me? (laughs) Uh, In fact, let's just close up church and go home right now. Uh, God's forgiven us so much. And I think sometimes we lose touch with that. But when we get more in touch with it, we begin to realize that I will never be able to give, forgive someone more than, they, more than God has forgiven me. I'll never be able to. God's perfect, I'm not. He's creator, I'm creation. I'll never be able to forgive someone more than God has forgiven me. He's forgiven me so much, I, I must, I should want to forgive others. First John chapter 4 and verse 8, I love this. John, the only apostle who died a natural death. Some say that when he wrote these letters, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, he's probably in his 90s. He writes this. He says, whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. And this is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. In other words, John's saying, it's not that we loved God first, he loved us first. He started this thing. Finally, he says, I I love this. He says, dear friends, which he was very apt to do, um, especially in his later years of life, as church history tells us. He would use this phrase, dear friends. Since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. Since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. The Apostle Paul echoes it in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 32 where he says, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other. How? Just as Christ, in Christ, God forgave you. So we forgive others just as we've been forgiven through the Lord Jesus. I think also we develop patience not only when we recognize how much we've been forgiven, but when we recognize that God is still at work in me. He's still at work. There's none of us that are a finished project. (laughs) And we need to realize that God is still at work in those who are around us. So here's what I've discovered in my life, that I tend to judge myself by my intentions and judge others by their actions. (laughs) We see someone 
do something we don't like and we assume they're impure motives. Which, by the way, is how you become elected president now in the United States, right? You see somebody who has a different policy idea than you do and you realize you, you accuse them of trying to destroy the government and destroy the country. It's, it's, it's what's happening in our culture. I'm really concerned. I don't want that to slip into the church. That we'd look at somebody's actions and we'd assume an evil intent. But so often we do that. And yet when, when I make the mistake, when I hurt someone, when I, when I do something that, that, that hurts someone else, I automatically say, well, I didn't mean to hurt them. And that wasn't what, I, what my motive was. What am I doing? I'm judging others by their actions. I'm judging myself by my intentions. And if we do that, it is a sure-fired way to, to, to take joy out of our relationships. If we want joy in our relationships, we begin to assume positive motives. I used to tell our church when we pastored in, in Iowa, I used to tell them, hey, if I see you over in the corner talking and looking my direction, I'm going to assume you're talking about me and that you're talking about what a great guy I am. You know, so often, don't we assume, we see somebody across the room, they're talking about us, they're looking at us, and we assume, what do we assume? We assume, what's wrong with me? What are they saying about me? You know, let's just be the kind of people, let's be, let's be Apostle Paul kind of people who just assume good motives on, on behalf of other people. We tend to judge others' failures as more significant than our own. Maybe you've never struggled with an addiction. It's very easy if you've never struggled with an addiction to, to uh, uh, think very poorly of someone who struggles with addiction. Why don't they just stop doing what they're doing? Everybody can do that. No, not everybody can. And maybe while they're struggling with an addiction, I'm struggling with gossip. <laughs> Uh-oh, I just stepped on uh, uh, over the line. Uh, you see, all of us struggle with different things. None of us is perfect. And so what we want to do is we want to restore joy to our relationships. How do we do that? We do that by, by recognizing all of us are in the same boat. The Bible says that all of us have sinned and, and fallen short of God's glory. James tells us that if we fall short in one area of the law, we are guilty of all of it. So you might say, well, uh, you know, I, I've, I've never gossiped, but uh, uh, man, I, I just can't stop whatever, whatever habit I've got. So I'm better than the other. No, we, we, it, listen, if we failed in one point, we failed in, in everything. So often we look at people and we think, oh man, they've got their, their act together. No, they don't. All of us, all of us have failed. So we need to be a place of grace where we accept each other, where we're at, and understand that all of us are struggling with, with different things. W what do you struggle with? Maybe it's anger, maybe it's lust, maybe it's bitterness, maybe it's overeating. I don't know what your thing is, but realize that other people with their issues see their issues and they struggle with their issues in the same way that you struggle with your issues. So what do we need to do? We need to be patient because God's not finished with any of us yet. <laughs> Amen. That was a well-timed thank God. Yeah, thank God. Thank God that, that this isn't all there is to it. And we're in this thing together. So we need, to be, we need to be tender during the trials because if we are, it'll come back to bless us. Be tender with one another. Um, don't say, I told you so, even if you told them so. <laughs> Proverbs 15, 1, this isn't projected, it's, it's just free this morning. But Proverbs 15.1 says, a gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. Ephesians 4.29 says, let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word is as good for edification, for building up, according to the need of the moment, that it may, and this is, this is so powerful, that it may impart grace to those who hear. You and I can actually extend I believe, extend the grace of God into people's lives by our response to one another. We're in a powerful, powerful position. If we know Christ, we're in a powerful position to see lives changed. The last thing I would say is, as we look at this whole idea of experiencing joy in relationships is to let God love through you. Let God love through us. Philippians chapter 1 and verse 8 Paul writes and he says, God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. 
that affection can be translated loyal compassion. So it, means, it means putting yourself in the other person's place. And really, it's, it's the highest form of love. Next week, we're going to look more intently at this passage of Scripture in Philippians chapter 2 and verse 5, which really is the centerpiece of the book of Philippians. In fact, uh, what I'm about to read to you is a poem that was uh, a first century poem. We aren't sure if Paul actually wrote it or if he's quoting it. It was something that the church kind of turned into a, a church hymn, but it was, it was something of that magnitude. And it's fascinating because it's kind of the centerpiece of the book of Philippians, and every section kind of relates back to this uh, idea of, of having the same attitude in ourselves that was in Christ Jesus. This is what Paul says. So in your relationships with, with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. What's his mindset? Who being in very nature God, did not regard equality with God as something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant and being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. It's really amazing that instead of merely judging us, Jesus came to earth to live among us. And not only did he live among us, but he went to the cross for us and he paid the penalty for our sin so that we could experience eternal life. John reminds us in John 17, 3, and this is eternal life, that they might know thee, the one true God, Jesus is speaking, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent, whom you've sent. That's eternal life, having a real, vital relationship with God. And now he calls us to live in that same way, to live sacrificially. So, this week, I'd, I'd invite you to take on a, a love project, but don't do it all by yourself because in our own strength, we'll fail. But when we do it in the name of Jesus, his strength will enable us. If we're praying the positive prayer, we're praying for people, we're, we're thankful for those relationships, there's something that happens inside of us that the Holy Spirit comes in and helps us to love in ways that Jesus loves, and that's where lives are changed. What, what I would love to see happen, and I, I think already Flag has a wonderful reputation. You know, I get around town and people find out I'm the pastor of Flag, and, and so they talk about you. Um, and they say very, very positive things. They say that, that we're a, a loving church, that we're very good for the community, and that's, that's wonderful. I pray that that would just increase. I pray that we'd be known as a place that loves everybody. I pray that we'd be known as a place that extends grace to everybody because we're in need of grace, right? I pray that, that Flag Church would, would become that place in our community where wherever people might find themselves, they'd recognize that there's a place here for them so that they could experience the love of Christ. And, and when that happens, there is great joy in relationships. So would you stand with me? Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you so much. Thanks for your word. Thanks for your Holy Spirit that makes your word alive in us. Lord, thank you that you are at work in us. It's really overwhelming when we think about it, that, that today your spirit has been speaking to us that today your spirit dropped maybe a name into a heart or, or into our minds. That, Lord, you've spoken to us about how we can live in right relationship with someone else. Lord, I pray for, for encouragement for uh, a parent who's here, who perhaps has a, a, a child who's wandered from the faith. And, and that parent's beginning to give up hope. Lord, I, I pray for a a new joy in that relationship that would be filled with grace. Lord, I pray for those who perhaps have been hurt in relationships and are looking for a way to forgive. I pray, Lord, that the truth of your word would set us free to forgive and to begin to call out the good 
that you've placed in our lives to recognize, God, how much you've forgiven us. God, do in us what we can't do in ourselves. Restore the joy of relationship. Restore the joy of our relationship with you, the joy of relationship with others. And as we're in an attitude of prayer, I wonder if there are some who would, uh, just by an upraised hand, say, Tom, would you please pray for me because I've got a relationship that I, I need God to work in. You just slip up your hand. I've, I'm, I've, got a, I've got a love project that I need to go after this week. Several hands. Thanks. Just slip your hand up, put it right back down. God bless you. Thank you. Maybe um, this morning uh, you're at a place where you're not sure about the relationship that I talked about that we can have through Christ with God, that we can experience forgiveness. Maybe you're in a situation, you're in a place in your life right now where you're saying, you know, if something were to happen to me today, I'm not sure where I'd spend eternity. But I want to know that I'm forgiven. I want to know that God has this and that I'm in right relationship with him. If that's your situation, I'm going to ask you to slip your hand up. And just by that upraised hand, you're saying, would you please pray for me? I need to know Christ as my Savior. Thanks. God bless you. God's at work. He's speaking to our hearts. If you slipped up your hand, would you just place it over your heart right now? You're saying, yeah, I, I need a change in some relationships. I need the joy restored. We're going to pray that God would do something, actually work a miracle in our hearts. Heavenly Father, in this moment of time, God, we ask you for a miracle. We ask you, Lord, to, to change our hearts first so that we're equipped, so that we're filled with your spirit and we can love others. And so, God, we ask that you would, you would change us. You'd help us, Lord, to be grateful for the good things in relationships. Lord, I pray that you'd help us to begin to pray positive prayers. For those perhaps who have hurt us, per, perhaps, uh, or, or are causing difficulties for us. God, we pray that you would help us to begin to walk in faith in these relationships and believe you, Lord, for the best. To extend grace, Lord, where grace is needed, because you've given us so much grace. God, we pray, I pray for for us as a church that, that, Lord, you would use us to an even greater and greater and greater capacity here in Pittsburgh, in the surrounding communities, the surrounding area, southeast Kansas, southwest Missouri. God, that you would, you would do a work in us so that when people see us, it would be like the jailer seeing the actions of the Apostle Paul, that, that people would see us and see our lives and they'd say, what must I do to be saved? How can I experience that kind of life? God, do that in us. Do that in us. Lord, as we close this service in, in worship, we pray, Lord, that, that you would just solidify that work in us this morning. We love you, Jesus, with all of our hearts. We thank you, Lord, for the joy that you're reestablishing in relationships. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's worship the Lord.